now, he's got more funding for roads through the association. Um, <clears throat> with the Shellbach, they, the families became quite close um, with Rose. So she corresponds with uh, Shellbach quite a bit. And she's talking about cabins that she stayed at at the auto camp. And she would rather have, let's see, which room? Well, there's one cabin in particular. Um, 349 is one she particularly liked. And it was less expensive than cabin 102. And uh, so I can only imagine that cabin 102 was the higher price at $2.25 a night. And uh, one, uh, 349 was uh, less expensive than $1.75 a night. Of course, this is uh, you know, 1940. Uh, plus, you had to pay for your linen. So it cost a little bit more. 50 cents for the first night, 35 cents for each additional night. And a bath was 25 cents. So it could add up. But after four days, you got a 10% discount. And this is all from a little brochure about this auto camp that a friend uh, took some pictures of. We don't have a copy in our collections here of this brochure, but there's one at the Autry Museum in Southern California. Uh, it's great little information on this. Uh, the cabins have been renumbered. And so I have no idea if there's a cross-reference of what the old number and the new number was. So I just took a couple of photos of some of the cabins at the auto camp. And that's the brochure itself. Uh, the auto camp is over there by the, uh, uh, what's that hotel? Maswick, by the backcountry office where the train comes in. Uh, so it's back off the rim. And originally, I thought it was the Bright Angel cabins, and I went wandering around there looking for cabin numbers. Uh, Sale in 1940, and uh, talking about the um, the old schoolhouse in Great Canyon Village that still exists there. It's by the, the Park Ranger headquarters. And this is going to be the naturalist area, the naturalist workshop. And uh, it's the building is still in use. The, the library, the community the library is in the back part of it. And no, it's actually, let's see, it's in the front part, the back part of some offices. Uh, so it's still being used, but the naturalist was there, and, and people would come up to the canyon, and they'd actually do uh, kind of some workshops there, and they do a lot of tours. And that's where the specimens were at the time Rose was there. Uh, another new species, 1941, and uh, they're going to name it in her honor. She's, she's got about four or five plants named after her. She's writing the Shellbach again and talking about uh, a garden club that they're meeting down in Phoenix, an uh, annual meeting. And she's wondering if she could uh, borrow some of the uh, exhibit specimens from the canyon for this meeting. And she does get them. It's kind of hard to read, but um, talks about her having these specimens down in Phoenix. Um, she was also involved with the, uh, the society that founded the Desert Botanical Garden. We are in 1942. This is. Uh, more about the meeting down there in Phoenix and about other plants. And she mentions, uh, and there's mentions made of uh, McDougall, um, who was working on the plant guide. Great Canyon Natural History Association did these checklists and, and guides to flora and fauna in the canyon. And uh, he's working on this one in the 40s at the time, and Rose helped him out quite a bit. So she gets a special mention here. Um, the other side gratefully acknowledges also the invaluable aid given by Mrs. Rosie Collum in the compilation of this checklist, by which the task could scarcely have been accomplished in the time allotted to it, etc. And it's kind of interesting, you know, Rose has been at the canyon oh, seven years now, off and on doing her work, but she's uh, got quite a reputation. And another interesting thing about her is um, when she's writing, she usually signs her name Rose Collum. She doesn't sign it Mrs. Burke Collum or Mrs. W. E. Collum. And um, people start referring to her now as Mrs. Rose Collum. And 
uh, I don't think she ever kept it in journals. People have asked, well, what kind of a person do you think she was? But we don't have other than a few correspondence with her husband and Michelle Bach and a couple of other people that uh, it's hard to get a real good take on her, but I see her as very independent. Uh, she was looking for something to do and started wandering around identifying plants, starts corresponding with scientists, botanists. Uh, she's always signing her name as Rose Collin. She writes some great letters to her husband, Bert, loving relationship, but um, it's like she doesn't seem to be possessed by anybody but herself. So she's uh, always Rose. Okay, what do we got here? Oh, um, so Rose is back at the park in 49. She missed one year. She didn't uh, go there in 48 because Bert is ill. So she spent a year and a half taking care of Bert. And so she's back identifying plants still. She's still uh, down in the, at the mine, back and forth. She never drove. She would get the she would take the bus up, or she would shell box for a lot of times. She would eat the film and the shell box and drive her up to the camp. And Bert dies on January 3rd, 1951. So after a year and a half of illness, uh, she comes back in 49 and 50, and then 51 in January, he dies. And uh, naturalist shell back and his family uh, took in to leave and went down to the funeral in Phoenix of Bert. And that's on, he dies, Bert dies on January 4th, and on the 5th is a funeral. And on the 7th, um, this is a little thing from uh, Louis Schoenbeck's son talking about his remembrance of Rose. And she's back, uh, probably got a ride back up to the canyon with the uh, shell box. So three days later, she's back at the canyon collecting plants, working in their air brain. And she donates, let's say which she donates that set of the Audubon of Botany by Mary Walcott that she had been given in 1938. She donates it to the Natural History Association Library, which is transferred to the Research Library at uh, Grand Canyon. And that was the, her set, those five that are still there. That, these pictures came from. And um, next year, she's got more grant money from work on the Park Herbarium for the Natural History Association. Another one of her lists, and I don't know whether these draft lists are, and, or I mean, written on the spot or whether these were transposed, but uh, very nicely done and kept after. And there are hundreds of specimens, specimen sheets that she has up at the Parker Berry, which you can see. It's at the, uh, the Research <coughs> Museum, and you can call them up, Colleen Hyde or Kim Beeson or Mike Quinn, and make arrangements and go in and see. Uh, among other things, you can see Rose's uh, herbarium specimens. Uh, she adds, uh, let's see, 1953, adds another 49 specimens, uh, cataloging 239. Interesting that she doesn't have an Okatia specimen in there. Uh, she didn't get that far west in Grand Canyon. Let's see, where are we? 54. Um, catalog six plants collected by Rose. Uh, the, a new one, not named after her, but a new specimen. This is the last record that I can find of uh, Rose being at the canyon. This referred to uh, the 53 collected, when those were identified. But that same year, she's uh, in the newspapers again. She was in the Los Angeles Times in the, in the 30s. She's in the Arizona Republic in the 54. And she's on uh, the radio also. KYCA, I haven't looked up anything about that. Be nice to see if they still had that. Uh, Coconino County, she went out to, besides Grand Canyon, she was out at uh, Sunset Crater. So this is the Sunset Crater Blazing Star that I couldn't find an image for. 
<clears throat> December of 56, Rose is uh, back in Georgia, she's got her sisters and taken ill and dies six days after her birthday. Um, uh, I think her 86th birthday. And I mentioned about the last written record of her at Grand Canyon was 54, and there's a couple years later. And I can't find any record that anyone knew that she had died at Grand Canyon. Um, I find that kind of sad that here she spent uh, about 16 years off and on at Grand Canyon. Uh, but probably because she moved away, probably because she quit collecting and really working, that uh, now she's back in Georgia and people didn't know um, that she had died. <clears throat> Looking at the cemetery records, it appears that her name wasn't even Rose, it was Rosa. And I don't know where the variation came from, but Everything I could find on, about her has always been Rose. But uh, she was with that society that founded the Desert Botanical Garden, and they put out a Swirland Bulletin. So they mentioned about um, Rose's death on the December 26th, and uh, mentions that her uh, herbarium presented to the DBG five years previously. So they have their her. Uh, pretty much are non-Grand Canyon specimens. <clears throat> While she was there over a 15-year uh, period, 10 years in the 30s and 40s, and then five years later with that gap of one year when uh, Burke was built, had 826 records of Grand Canyon. And this one, Uh, off this database, this is just the first one off the, the list from the 1940 collecting. Her first specimen, uh, first trip, June 23rd, 38, was a uh, Renunculaceae, and her last one in 1952, um, which is, what is it, Lapula occidentalis. Something that I couldn't tell you anything about. No, we'll continue. <clears throat> uh, when the Charlie's Angels of Botany were doing this uh, body field guide, I said, you know, if, uh, if I don't know whether you're going to dedicate this book to anyone, but uh, if you haven't thought about it or if you're interested, I have a suggestion of Rose Column to do. So, among others, Elzada Clover. And Lois Jotter from the 38 Neville's trip, Whitney Hodson from the Desert Botanical Garden. Uh, there's Rose Column with a dedication to us. And a nice uh, quote from Rose from one of her letters to Burt in the 40s during the, during the war, uh, which is worth uh, reading out loud. In these troubled times when the, all the world is so upset, I think it rather steadies one to consider the lilies of the field, to examine closely the exquisite texture and coloring of the petals of many flowers, to look with appreciation upon a magnificent forest, and to feel thankful for the beautiful world in which we live. <clears throat> 25 years ago, in the Swarland Bulletin of the Desert Botanical Garden, it was suggested uh, that for three possible candidates for the Arizona Women's Hall of Fame, and Rose was one of them. And uh, as far as I know, keep checking the list, and none of these three women have become members of the Arizona Hall of Fame, so uh, Women's Hall of Fame. So I have uh, another talk to give next week at the Arizona History Convention on Rose, and uh, after that I'm going to consider following up and seeing uh, what we can do about getting Rose some more recognition. There's also the um, Arizona Women's Heritage Trail, and uh, a woman who was a member of that was in uh, last year uh, researching the special collections, and she suggested this organization also. And uh, when I did this talk last month in Prescott, the librarian there in Prescott said, what about the Arizona Heritage, Women's Heritage Trail? I said, well, it's uh, on the list too, so I'll see about uh, perhaps nominating Rose for both of these 
uh, recogni recognition awards. And uh, that pretty much wraps it up. I just want to thank uh, people at the Desert Botanical Garden, Whitney Hodson, Beth Brand, and Jane Cole, and National Great Canyon National Park Museum and Library. Colleen High, Kim Beeson, Michael Quinn, Susan Eubanks, and Betty Upchurch. And a great thanks to uh, Rose Cullen, Rose of Grand Canyon. Thank you.